Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this morning, that this is a day that you have made and we can rejoice in it. Father, we come to look at the plagues this morning, and, and Lord, help us to have a, a better understanding of the reason or the purpose of the plagues, and in looking at the plagues, Lord, to have a better understanding of who you are, the God that we follow, the God that we serve. Open our hearts, open our minds to hear what you have to say to each one of us today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, so this morning we're going to look basically from chapters 5 to chapters 10. Uh, although, <laughs> good thing the readers didn't have to read those five chapters. Oh, that'll take the time of the sermon. <laughs> but, but we're going to look actually at the first nine plagues uh, this morning. And, and then next week, um, Michael Taylor is going to preach. And we're going to look at the tenth plague, the Passover uh, lamb, and, and actually what that means uh, to each one of us. But, but this morning, we j- we're actually going to look at the nine plagues. When we look at the plagues... I guess we, we have different responses to the plagues, doesn't it? We, we look at the plagues and we think, oh, great, you know, we have a God who is, who is just, a God who judges sin, the God who stands up for righteousness, God who stands up to protect his people. That's a great God. Then you have the other side who says, you know, how can God do that to a group of people? How can God be so cruel in bringing plagues to a nation of Egypt? And you may have your views from one end to the other and anything in between. And and my hope that at the end of uh, this message, you will have a better understanding of who God is because that is the whole purpose of the plagues, to help us actually understand who is the Lord. So we want to understand God through the plagues. And uh, the first point I want to bring across is this, that God was revealing who he was to Pharaoh. So in Exodus 5, which is the start of that 10 chapters that I was talking about, um, Moses goes up to Pharaoh, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. And in response to that question, who is the Lord that I should obey him, I should worship him, that statement or that question triggered the plagues, where God was actually showing to Pharaoh, who is this Lord that he should obey him? Who is this Lord that he should worship him? And the, and the whole purpose of those plagues was sort of a, a God's response to, to that question, One of the interesting things to notice, and as we look at the plagues, I'm sorry, you can't maybe see that very clearly. The the plagues were, in a sense, very carefully chosen by God. Because each of those plagues actually deals with the God of Egypt. You see, when, when Pharaoh asked this question, who is the Lord that I should obey him? He was not asking the question as an atheist. He, he definitely believed in God. He definitely believed in the supernatural. He actually had all these magicians, sorcerers, priests around him. Um, so it was not that he was actually an atheist. He was, if you like, a polytheist. Because that was what Egyptians were. They, they worshipped a whole lot of gods. But not only was he a polytheist, he was also a pluralist. In a sense that you have your God, I have my God. You have your faith, I have my faith. Why should I convert to obey your God when I actually have my own gods? That was, that was clearly actually what Pharaoh was saying. Why? <laughs> Why should I come and, and follow your God? What is so special about your God that makes him superior than my God? I, I have these magicians who can do miracles and do these tricks. You know, why should I convert? And, and I guess that's the question often we, we face in the world that we live in, isn't it? Who, who is this God that you follow that I should convert to him? I, I have my religion. I have my beliefs. Why? Why should I accept? Why should I follow your beliefs when I have my beliefs? We live in a pluralistic society. We can all choose what we want to believe. And so in the diagram, if you can see it, <laughs> we, we have what 
each plague represented. It was, in a sense, dealing with the different gods of Egypt. So, for example, the Nile. The Nile, if you like, was the, the live stream of Egypt. It, it was very much um, a place that people f- drink, find life in. And so they have a god, Osiris, that, that sort of um, is the god of the Nile, or the goddess, rather, of the Nile. And the same with frogs. They have a, 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 a goddess of, uh, in the shape of a frog. She was a goddess of fertility, and so on. And so in choosing those, those plagues, in some sense, God was actually dealing with, with the gods of Pharaoh. And when Pharaoh said, who is this God that I should obey him? God was actually showing, well, this is who I am. And I'm dealing with what you believe and shooting down, if you like, what you claim to be your God. If you go on and read in the passage that actually was read for us this morning, in Exodus 7, verse 17, uh, this is what the Lord says, By this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into the blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. So Pharaoh said, who is this Lord that I should obey him? God says, by this, you will know that I'm the Lord. By this, you will know that I am the true God. Again, in Exodus 9, 13 to 14, where the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, Let my people go so that they may worship me, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people, so you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. Okay? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? God says, you ask that question, let me show you. Let me explain to you who I really am. I am the God that needs to be worshipped. I am the God that there is no other gods like me in the whole earth. Very much a powerful statement, isn't it, that, that God is making here. You see, God never wanted to kill Pharaoh or, or destroy his, his people or make them suffer with the plagues. All God wanted is for Pharaoh to set his people free from the captivity that he has forced them in, that they were being tortured through slavery. All he wanted them, him to do is set my people free so that I might worship him, worship God. All, that's all he wanted. If Pharaoh did that, there wouldn't have been a problem, isn't it? And yet Pharaoh was stubborn. He was rebellious. And he said, who is this God that I should obey him? I have my God. So why, why should I let your people go when I don't believe in your God? I'm still going to punish them. I'm still going to make them suffer because I don't believe in your God. And God then says, let me show you who I am. And that sort of started the plagues. The second point I want to, make, to mention is this, that The plagues actually reveals what happens when we turn our backs on God. One of the things you would notice with regards to the plagues is that it's so very natural. It's based on natural phenomena about things that happen in everyday life. I mean, if if I was God, you know, and I, I wanted Pharaoh to repent, I would think to myself, now, I turned Lot's wife into a pillar of salt. And so here I am in Pharaoh's court, and I would start working down his officials. One person turns to salt, another, 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 another. And then I say to Pharaoh, you're next. <laughs> Wouldn't he repent? <laughs> I, I, I think he probably would, you know. He didn't want to be turned into a pillar of salt, you know. And, and so yet, you know, he didn't do that. He did something that was so very natural. And as I was thinking about that, um, I I was thinking about creation story, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So notice there was darkness, it was formless, it was empty. Three things. And then we we hear God saying, let there be light, 
and there was light. And at the end of that whole passage in verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So in, in a sense, the creation story tells us a picture of what God does in the gospel. He says, let there be light. And then he takes something that was formless and void, chaotic, and turns it into, into gives order and brings fulfillment into, that, into their life. So when you look at the creation story, at the very beginning, formless and void, and then God starts this work of creation. Uh, day one, he separates light from darkness. Day two, he sort of separates the waters above the heavens with the waters under the heavens. And third day, he forms the land and sea and separates it. So he was, in a sense, giving form to what was formless. And then from day three onwards, he starts to fill the earth. So day three, he actually presents all the vegetation. And day four, when he separates light from darkness, he then puts the stars in the sky, the sun and the moon, to be the source of light. When he separates the, the waters and, and creates the heavens, he, he puts in all the, 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 the sea creatures and all that. And then day six, uh, he fills the land with animals and, and finally humanity. So in, in the creation story, you, you see, I guess if you like, the gospel of God, isn't it? Something that was dark, formless and void. And then he says, let there be light. And then there was form. And then he filled the earth. You know, it's, it's sort of, of the work of God. What happens in the plagues? The plagues sort of, when you rebel against God, so here is a Pharaoh rebelling, we see a, a backward movement from the story of creation, isn't it? Because you see, it starts with this blood, and the ninth plague is darkness. And actually, when you start thinking a little bit about those plagues, the, the river turning to blood, and whether it was literal blood or some form of algae that gave it the red coloring doesn't really matter. But what happened when the river was filled with blood? It was undrinkable, and the ecosystem starts to break down. The fish all starts to die. And what happens when you have an unhealthy river source. It leads to the creatures that are in the river sort of wanting to escape, doesn't it? And so it's not surprising the second plague is a plague of frogs. All of a sudden, they, they, they went out of the rivers, the streams, the water holes. It says the whole of Egypt, all the water holes was turned to blood, and the frogs all started to come out and fill their homes and offices and churches and beds and everything was filled with frogs. And then uh, um, Pharaoh repented, Moses prayed, the frogs all died. What did they do? The Bible tells us they made it all the heaps of dead frogs. The dead frogs start to rot and decay, and it says that there was a stench right across Egypt, which is not surprising when you have rotting flesh. <laughs> what was the next plague? <laughs> what happens when you have rotting flesh? Nets and flies, isn't it? <laughs> Because that comes out of rotting flesh. And so you ha all of a sudden you have nets and flies and all that. And they didn't have the frogs to eat the flies, so it starts to spread. And what happens when you have filthy, dirty flies? It affects the livestock. It affects humanity. Boils all starts to come. And it, 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 it causes diseases. And, and so you see, uh, uh, in a sense, in those plagues, and believe me, I believe they were miracles, but also it shows, I guess, in some ways, what happens when we live in rebellion against God? What happens to creation, the environment, when we are actually not taking that seriously? And so you're starting to see, and then you see the locusts and, and the hailstones, and then darkness. <laughs> it's sort of a reversal of the creation story, isn't it? From, light, uh, from darkness to light, and here you see a sort of a, a backward trend. What happens when we say to God, who is the Lord that I should obey you? That I want to live my life my way. I, I don't want to follow you, God. I don't want to do what you want me to do. 
I don't want to follow your word and your rules. I want to live life my way. Selfishness, egoistic. What does that do to relationships? What does that do to environment? And so I see through the plagues that, that this rebellion of Pharaoh who says, I don't want to follow you. God starts to deal with all his gods. But not only that, this rebellious nature of Pharaoh led to, to all these things happening in, in Egypt, the breakdown of the environment. Which leads me then to this final point where God reveals himself as the one who saves the world. And very interesting that if actually if God's purpose of the plague was to destroy the Egyptians, then here is one example where God actually tells the Egyptians, this is my warning to you, don't stay outdoors because the hail is going to come and it's going to kill you. And so he says this to Moses, give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter because the hail will fall on every person and animal that has not been brought in and is still out in the field and they will die. And then in verse 20, going on, those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. But those who ignored the word of God left their slaves and livestock in the field, and they were the ones who died. So the, the plagues the, the, were, were, were taking an Im- making an impact because there were people in the Pharaoh's courts, his officials, that some of them began to believe in this God uh, of the Israelites. And because they began to believe in the God of the Israelites, they went out and brought their, their people in, they brought their livestock in, and they were spared. God is a God who who doesn't want to destroy. And he's giving them this opportunity where where they can go out and save the stock, their their people from their danger. They never showed the same grace to the Israelites. And yet God was, was being gracious to them. They were mean to the Israelites. God was being gracious uh, to, the, uh, to the Egyptians. So God is wanting to save. We see that in the way he protected the Hebrews, the Israelites, his people. That no harm came upon the Israelites when the plagues hit Egypt. Because God wanted the Hebrews to really know who he was. That he is a God they can trust. God wanted the Israelites to know that he has not failed them. He has been there. He has heard that cry over the last 400 years. He has been watching over them and he will protect them. He wanted them to know this. Later on, we read in Deuteronomy, sorry, in Exodus 9, uh, those officials, so I, I read that. But we, we go on uh, to Deuteronomy and in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, this is what God says to the Israelites. Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds, like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other See, what God is wanting you and I to know, and as he wanted the Israelites to know, that he is the Lord, your God, there is no other. There is no other God like our God. He showed that to Pharaoh by the way he defeated the idols of of the Egyptians. And he was telling the Israelites the whole reason why you have seen these plagues and not be harmed by those plagues, is that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. This is a truth God wants you and I to know. One of the reasons why we grapple with all sorts of theological issues is because we don't believe that the Lord our God is is one, and there is no other like him. And because we don't believe that, that governs, how we live our lives. If we, if we really believe 
that there is no other God like our God, wouldn't we take God's word seriously? Wouldn't we want to live a life based on God's word? But the reality is this, that we, we don't believe that there is no other God like our God. We hold the view that all religions lead to God. And what, what happens when we hold that view? We then become pluralistic. It's okay to have your faith, but as you can see from the plagues, God is not willing to stand with other gods. We either believe that he is God and we worship him, or we choose not to. God has chosen not to stand with other gods. And that's the whole story of the plagues. That God doesn't want to be stand as equal with other gods. It's either him or nothing else. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And that was what God wanted the Israelites to know. But God is not just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is the God of the whole world as well. God is the God of the whole earth. And he wanted the Gentiles also to know this. And the whole purpose of the plagues was not to destroy Egypt, but to help them know who he is and why he should be obeyed. And he was in some ways answering the question that the Pharaoh asked. And so when we come to Exodus 9, verse 15 to 16, this is what God says to Pharaoh. For by now, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague, with just one plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You see, God didn't need to do 10 plagues to, to, to get the Egyptians to, 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 to let Israelites go. He could have wiped Egypt out of the face of the, of the earth. God could have done that. God could have destroyed Egypt, but that was not his plan. That was not his purpose. His purpose, as you can see here, is that his goal is to show Pharaoh his power when he asked the question, who am I that I should obey you? God was answering that question. But more important, God wanted his name to pro be proclaimed in all the earth. So in other words, through what God did in Egypt, the world will realize who God really is. A book will be written, the Bible, that talks about the plagues. A movie would be made and Charlton Heston would become famous. No, that's not what God said, but, but people will talk about these plagues and would begin to realize that this God stands alone. This God is a God that, is, that, that has no other gods greater than him. And that is what God wants us to know, you and I to know, the fact that this God is a great God, that there is no other gods like him. He stands alone. All the other religions, they may believe in their gods, but their gods do not stand as equal to Yahweh. We need to know that. And one of the reasons why I am a conservative theologian is because I believe there's no other God like our God. I believe that there is no other God equal to our God. I believe that he stands alone. And if I believe that in my heart, then I take his word seriously. I believe in the sanctity of life, so I don't support abortion or euthanasia. I believe in the sanctity of marriage, because those are principles laid down by God to a world who says, who is your God that I should obey him? And if we are following a world who says, who is your God that I should obey him, aren't we being pulled away from what God believes and stands for? And that is why I'm conservative in my view, because I have a high view of the God we follow. I have a high view of the God we serve. I have a high view of the God we worship. And that governs everything I believe and practice. 
as God says to Pharaoh, you ask the question, who am I that I should obey you? You have seen the answer, that your gods do not stand as equal to me. But more important, I could have destroyed you, but I've chosen not to because I'm more interested in saving. I'm more interested in wanting the world to know that I am God and that my name will be proclaimed throughout all the earth. And that is my belief. What is your belief? Do you believe in this God that God is showing Pharaoh, a God that stands with no equal, a God who stands alone, no one greater than him, a God whose name should be proclaimed in all the earth, to a world who says, who is your God that I should obey him? We can say, this is who we are. This is who we believe. This is our God. And not only that, are we willing to live our lives to demonstrate the saving power of God to the world in the way we, 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 sh- we are salt and light to, God, to, to the world, to, to, in the way we live and, 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 and in the environment around us? How are we looking after creation? That's part and parcel if we believe in this God who took chaos and made peace and made life and made hope and made joy. If we believe in that God, who can renew and revitalize not only people's life, but the environment we live in. If we believe in that, does it not mean we got to also live in a way that would take those things seriously? Because that is what my God says in his, in his word, which is on my iPad. <laughs> but if we believe in this God, then how are we living our life? Let's pray. Lord, in the the plagues, you are showing Pharaoh, the Egyptians, but the world, the answer to the question, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Lord, we believe or we want to believe that you are God. There's no one like you. There's no one other than you. There's no one greater than you. There's no one that is your equal. And time and time again, Lord, your word tells us that and shows us that. And yet, Lord, we live in a a pluralistic society where where our heart is torn by by what we see around us and, and we feel for people who genuinely hold the beliefs that they hold on to. And yet, God, We are doing them a disservice by not speaking out about this God who has no equal. A God who loves the world so much that he calls them to repentance in order that we can have life and have it abundantly. And so, Father, I just want to pray for each one of us, for myself especially, Lord, in the way I live, in the way we live our lives. Do we live our lives in a way that we believe in this God who is great in all the earth, who has no equal? And does my life show that? And I pray, Father, bring us down to this place of humility where we can just say, Lord, we have failed you. We have failed this almighty God. And yet, Lord, thank you for this grace that you show us in order that you reach out and say, I will restore you. I will renew you. I will give you hope. I will take the chaos of your life and bring a sense of unity, a sense of hope, a sense of joy. And so, Lord, help us to live a life that pleases to you. In Jesus' name, amen.